and then the other the other um sort of thing that I did while I was at the Graduate Institute was to network a lot. And I know that for some folks, networking can be kind of like a dirty word almost. It can be really intimidating for people. Um, but I really like to reframe networking as just sort of the art of connecting with people over common interests. And honestly, just kind of building a community of people who are interested in the same things as I did. So whether those were other students or just, I think as Adeline mentioned, just like, I think I had so many coffees and phone calls with people across Geneva just asking, what do you do? How did you get where you got? And I don't know if maybe it's sort of the friend, like overly friendly American personality, but I think that that those sort of coffees and, and conversations ended up playing into the work that I do now in community building and, and community management. Thank you so much. Celine, same question to you. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I think I have somewhat of a opposite experience. Maybe it's because the program was slightly different back then or because I was a bit younger and I knew I wanted to work in that field, but without a very specific idea of precisely what I wanted to do. And I think what helped me a lot afterwards uh, was to really go across uh, the, the board and and take a lot of classes that I were, was interested in, uh, in different range of, of refugee law to economic of development and, and really try to have a mix of those broad ex, ex cathedra classes and we develop a multidisciplinary approach to update everything, me an understanding of how have all those categories and uh, fields are related and imbricated into each other. Um, I think, of course, building a network, but I think developing and the Institute was really good at that, developing and prodding like some critical thinking and inter interdisciplinary approach to everything. And that's really what helped me afterwards to navigate the professional sphere. Okay. Any activities that you did that helped you? Um, at the time I was studying, I was also working uh, in just money making <laughs> at the time internships were mostly non paid so um, one had to balance out so I was doing um, opinion polls on the phone which actually helped me quite a lot later on and when you have to do campaigning and call random people uh, and try to get them interested um, and save up to do an internship afterwards um, yeah thank you so much Kilian same question yeah, I think I would agree with what Zane said. I, I had the same thing where I came in straight from my bachelor's into my master's. And so I think it was a time where <clears throat> I was obviously very interested in the classes that I was taking at the Institute, but I was also eager to go and do something more practical. And being in Geneva gave me the opportunity to get a lot of that experience, either with the modern United Nations or with the internship that I did with the Global Detention Project. And then I was really searching for something that was more hands-on. And so I had the opportunity to go and work with Mitsan Jumun and do something on the ground and, and work with people. And that really sort of triggered my idea of what I wanted to do in the future. And, and I, I realized, okay, I have the theory and I know the concept. Now let me go and apply them and see how I can help others that are doing really great work and, and use sort of my the privilege that I had of having that education and having that background and 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 use it for to help other people. Okay, thank you so much, Kilian. Adeline, um, has recruitment in peace building been affected by the pandemic? I, I haven't particularly experienced that, but of course, obviously, definitely has. I mean, everything has been affected by that. I think that there's two things. Um, I think that uh, a lot of the positions that are field based, um, I think there's been um, uh, there's also been issues with recruitment with regards to deployment, but also funding. I think a lot of organizations have reduced dramatically their funding um, due to due to donors uh, having not enough funds and governments are giving much less to peace building organizations at the moment. Um, so I think the yes, 
in um, there's, there's less jobs, uh, but there's also less deployments in the field because our work mainly is in the field if you work on real peace building issues. So, um, but I think there's also been a positive aspect, which is that organizations have also been much more flexible. So because of COVID, a job that would be based somewhere, uh, you know, in Yemen or in Mogadishu or in Nairobi um, has now turned into a flexible, possibly remote job. So in a way, um, that gives advantage to uh, people again. But then the problem with that is that it opens up uh, to many more candidates. And so you're competing for the same job with 700 worldwide people instead of 30 locals. So, um, so that's my experience. Um, as a consultant, I've been most of my work is in field, uh, in field, uh, field, can, field, field based conflict uh, zones. Um, and so I've, I haven't been able to, to travel, but um, now with modern technology, uh, I've been able to do conferences using um, local uh, enumerators going to the villages themselves. And so, so in a way, um, my work specifically hasn't been affected, but I think there are negatives and positives. Okay, thank you so much. And you, Anika, as you experienced, do you think um, the, um, it has been affected in peace building? It has been affected by the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, of course, it's it's obviously hard to be an authority on this, and also I think as Adeline was getting to, there's sort of different places and different ways to be engaged in peace building work, which is something that's really exciting about the field and also very confusing <laughs> about the field. But I think. And it's interesting because, in fact, this year we at the peace building platform has a, have ended up hiring more people than we ever have before. So hiring mm -hmm. dramatically increased for us. Um, one thing that I have noticed is that for a lot of like HQ based organizations or positions, they had a, a lot of organizations ended up with sort of a, a the whole line of their budget that was originally allocated towards like conference travel or travel to and from the field or any of that, that all had to be reallocated. Um, and so for us, we ended up sort of hiring more and, and also part, yeah, just part of the structure of Geneva Peace Week, which I guess is really specific. But I think uh, the priorities of organizations are, are shifting a bit. And I also think that now is really a good time to have digital skills. And so for anybody listening, if there's anything to sort of consider during the pandemic, it's, and that doesn't only mean sort of social media, there's also, um, I know organizations that teach facilitation courses on digital facilitation. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done to think about how do we connect online? I know the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue is doing a lot of work right now on digital medi mediation and how does that work? So I think now is, is, it, is a really good time to, to kind of to build skills there because there are just clearly shifting priorities. Okay, thank you so much. Celine, in your experience, have you been affected by the pandemic or have you seen any effect? Yeah, I, I think uh, when it comes to disarmament NGOs where I work uh, for the last few years, um, Funding has varied depending on which type of weapons you're talking about. Uh, some are more sexy to fund by rich countries than others. Um, but like right now, since the beginning of the year, what we've seen is that we usually have quite a significant budget for travel, travel to uh, different parts of the world for regional meetings and advocacy. Uh, which has been suspended, which has meant that we've done a lot of outreach in those regions to find local partners uh, in those countries that are able to do the work with us, for us, uh, because we simply cannot go. Um, so because of our travel budget being untouched, we've been able to um, send money and, and work uh, together. Um, I think the longer term effects will come fairly soon in the sense that a lot of organizations had their funding already secured for 2020 by the time the pandemic uh, hit, uh, which man means that the budget for this year is still all, all right, but the impact will be mostly next year. ICANN itself is quite lucky, um, but I know that among our partners, quite a lot are affected. But as Adeline said, um, that also means that for those still hiring, uh, it allows everyone to apply a bit everywhere. 
uh, for an internship uh, we opened a few weeks or months ago. Uh, we would have usually uh, applied applicants from Geneva. Well, now we have someone from Fiji, I think, because uh, despite the time difference, it doesn't really matter where the person is located, given that it's remote uh, and present. And I think it does give a lot of opportunity. I think a lot of organizations are really rethinking the way they work. What are the real needs? What are the real skills that they need today? And I think that, can, that really opens up a lot of opportunities uh, for people looking for jobs. Yes, thank you so much. Kilian? <clears throat> yeah, uh, I think I would agree with what Anika said. Um, I think there was a, a lull at the start of the pandemic, like in March or April, where you definitely saw organizations trying to adapt to the situation and just saying, okay, we're going to take off all the internships, we're going to take off all the job applications. Um, and we were quite lucky that we were able to maintain them. We saw a, a boost in applications, you know, hundreds of of students and prospective uh, applicants. But as as time went by, uh, I think the organizations have adapted. And I know that we have, uh, at the same as Celine said, like we've pivoted to doing our work virtually and working with a constituency that's global, but actually being able to engage them more. And it's actually been really beneficial where we found new ways, uh, like Celine described, of, uh, of working with country partners and and doing in country um, events and projects. And, and we really found it beneficial. And we've been lucky with funding as well, where you know the combination of having someone in office that isn't really uh, prone to respecting the rule of law and also um, the pandemic, we've managed to maintain our funding and we hope that that will continue next year. But I think it's a big shift, but I think people are adapting and hopefully it'll continue going forward. Okay, thank you so much. Adeline, um, as you have a lot of experience in consultancies with many organizations around the world, how did you use your time at the Institute to build your network? What did you do to facilitate this? But I think you already kind of answered in the first um, no, no, I, question. The thing is, is that what I, this is what I tell all, you know, people who are getting into this field, into the sector of peace building, and also, you know, who are doing studies is just, is basically go to the field, like get your butt to the field. <laughs> like you, if you do peace, conflict and security and, and, and you haven't been to the field and you haven't seen uh, what's going on there and how populations are affected by conflict and, and issues of insecurity, you have you don't you you have much less credibility, um, and so um, so what, that's what I did. So I used uh, I, I never went on holiday during the summer. So I told you the program was a year and a half, um, and in the free time and in the summers, well at the time we could travel. Um, I went I went to do you know volunteer work in Uganda. Uh, I went to Nepal, and then I travelled to the Congo. There were elections, uh, the first elections in 2006, first multi democracy, and so I went to do that, and I went to Congo took a backpack and went. Um, so obviously today with the pandemic, you you know, I mean, the excuse of the pandemic is fine. You go travel, you're in, you're in quarantine for two weeks, but you're there um, and you can stay there. So I think that uh, you can um, still go to the field and I think you should, and that's what, that's what I did. Um, and I think it opens a lot of, uh, it opens your perspective also on, on, on issues related to this topic, to be there. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so I just to go on to what I've already said about doing internships while you're here, networking, uh, and using contacts and professors that are, uh, you know, already on that topic. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Adeline. Anika. So, as we know, you just graduated <laughs> in September, <laughs> and students wanted to know how did you secure your job at the Geneva Peace Building Platform uh, since September 2019. Do you have any tips for the students who would like to undertake an internship uh, sure. or work during their studies? Sure. Yeah. So, so I started working there during the the my second year at the beginning of my second mm -hmm. year, and I also just want to preface my response here by I think I have I, everybody's sort of hiring experiences are really different, and I carry a lot of privilege both with the passport that I hold from the U.S. Um, which has played a role in the permit that I have, um, as well as I am English mother tongue. And I've been told that like having great fluency in English, it goes a really long way in Geneva. 
Um, and so that's just sort of, uh, those are just sort of circumstantial privileges that, that I carry. And so I think that that it's important to sort of note that that plays a role. Um, at the Graduate Institute, I, when I, when I first arrived, so I have noted now four times that I'm American, we have a very sort of particular university culture and even high school culture of extracurricular activities. And so when I came to the Graduate Institute, I sort of followed on in that tradition and, and really just got involved in student activities. Um, I got involved with the environmental committee and I know Zani is now the president, which is great. Um, and honestly, the way that I got my job at the Geneva peace building platform, just to be direct is I, I helped to organize the environmental committee's event for Geneva peace week in 2018. So 2 years ago, um, we did an insane communications campaign and filled the room and. We're able to partner really well with the Quaker United Nations office and and just had a phenomenal conversation and event and and afterwards the the Geneva Peace Week team I I had a coffee I this is one of my coffees I met up with their their coordinator for a coffee and just told her everything that we had done and and gave her sort of my advice on communications and and she said oh gosh we really need a communications specialist moving forward for Geneva Peace Week and. From that coffee until getting a job offer or even an intent to hire was six months and I had really no idea sort of what was going to happen. I just sent her a follow up email every couple months saying, hey, just checking in. No pressure in case you still need me. I'm doing nothing. Um, and and so there I, I just was kind of persistent. I think there's always a fear around following up with people people via via email. Um, and, and that all came out of, I think, some of the best advice that I got maybe five or six years ago from, from one of my mentors in the peace building field was to, to pick a skill and to hone a skill. Um, I was really unclear about what I wanted to do. I just graduated with my bachelor's in international affairs. And she said, Annika, why don't you, you should just pick a skill and, and really work on it? And, and she said, I think I, I know you like writing. I think you might be into communication. So why don't you just pick some random jobs in communications and start building those skills and, and it'll kind of fall together in the future. So I, I sent her a very long thank you email <laughs> recently um, because I think that that sort of contributed. So, yeah, getting getting really involved with student initiatives, asking people to coffee and focusing on what types of skills you can build. Those would be my my tips. Thank you. Amazing tips for the students. <laughs> I will share them. <laughs> Céline, um, having worked for NGOs in India, New York, and Japan, what skills did you feel were necessary to have before working in this field and in such different settings? Well, I think it's a bit accidental. Um, it's my own path it has always been a little accidental. I, I suppose it's very adaptable. Um, pushy, but too nagging, uh, but show you motivated. Uh, after graduating, um, I mean, of course, in, at the Institute, everything was bilingual and I could uh, understand and read English quite well, but speak or write was not great. So I decided to move to New York for three months to do intensive English classes at NYU because it was fun and I was young and you know, that was <laughs> great. Um, and while there, I needed to find a good reason to stay. Um, so I decided to look for an internship and looking for an internship in the international NGO sphere in New York was not easy because, as Nika said, it's US culture, a lot of the students have done a lot of internship, traveled, volunteered, it's so many. I mean, what was the different the, the added value I could bring? Um, it was a bit of a coincidence that the organization I one of the organizations I reached out to knew really well one of our professors at uh, the Graduate Institute uh, and said, Oh, you're a former student of his, like come and meet me. And you know. mm -hmm. <laughs> I and that's how I got in for an unpaid internship for six months. Uh, and I landed there having to coordinate ambassadors sitting in the security council and doing research. And, and I think the Graduate Institute had prepared us really well. But you have to kind of adapt to what is expected of you when you just land there. And um, 
from then on, and I hate to be in that position because when I was looking for a job, asking for advice, all those people that had jobs that I wanted was telling me, it's about being at the right place at the right time. And I was like, ah. Easy to say, <laughs> that doesn't help me. But it, it's a bit like this too, uh, by doing an unpaid internship for six months, you become somewhat indispensable, you made a lot of contact and you get hired. And after a few years, when I decided to move to Tokyo, um, I was having coffee with someone I met in the elevator every day, uh, mentioning I wanted to move to Tokyo. And they're like, oh, actually my headquarters are in Tokyo. How about I connect you with this person? And, and one thing was led to the left. Thanks. So I suppose it's being adaptable and a bit uh, pushy in the positive sense of the term, like really show your motivation and that you're ready to do what it takes to put your foot into the door. Um, okay. I think adapting to India was a very different context. Um, which actually felt quite naturally because as Adeline was saying, yeah, you're not really credible working on some initiatives if you don't know what it means in the, on the ground and what reality it means. And I think it, it takes some adapt, ad, adaptation, but it, as long as you're motivated and you know that this is really what you want to do, you're ready to do whatever it takes, I suppose. And do you think your time at the... Um... Do you think your time at the Institute prepared you for that di diversity? I think so, because I mean, if you look at the students, uh, you have people from all over with very different backgrounds. Some were maybe five or ten years older than us because they already had a lot of uh, professional experience before. Some were just out of uh, college like uh, us from different places. Same with professors. A lot of them were um, practitioners in their own field with a lot of experience uh, being able to share with with us this uh, this kind of experience and of course generally speaking uh, travel I think being exposed yeah. to different uh, ways different methods different uh, states of mind I mean it really broadens your horizons and I think like if you cannot actually necessarily get a job somewhere else just travel and really be exposed to different realities is really what matters. Okay, thank you so much, Céline. Kilian, uh, you worked at the Global Detention Project and Médecin du Monde during your studies. And where did you find these internships and how was it working during your master's? Yeah, um, so for the Global Detention Project, uh, there was someone who, who had completed the the masters in international relations um like one two years before me that i had met at an event and we had talked about it and it was like oh like this is a really good organization uh, at the time i was really interested in migration related issues <clears throat> and the global detention project works on on identifying detention centers for migrants and refugees um and so I, I i was really interested in that and i applied uh, and i got in and I think that connection was really important, you know, talking to, to students who had done the program in the past and, and do it that networking aspect. With Mid San Jimon, it was a bit different. They, I, I, at the time, I had a lot of friends who lived in the north of France. And, um, you know, I wanted to spend some time there. Uh, and someone just recommended looking at Mid San Jimon. And so I looked into that and I was looking for something a little bit different. And so, so, so that's how I ended up there. Uh, and it was a really good experience, you know, um, and I think it was it was also like the graduate institute gave me the opportunity to look at a very broad set of uh, of things and just gave me the opportunity to say, OK, I'm going to try out things that I haven't tried out in the past and 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 talk to people I haven't talked to in the past. And and that allowed me to sort of broaden my horizon. And for Médecins du Monde, I realized that you did that during your Christmas break, right? I mean, during the, the break. Yeah, yeah, it was about two months, I think. It was a bit longer than, than the Christmas break. Uh, but yeah, I, I think at that, at that point in, in my studies, I was really looking for something completely different, like something practical on the ground. Uh, and the migration issues were very, very present. I mean, they still are in Europe. But at the time, you know, the, there were a lot of deaths in the Mediterranean. There were a lot of deaths at the border. With uh, with England um, and yeah, it was very front front of mind. And that was field work, like really next door. I mean, I assume. Yeah, yeah, you. yeah absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's something that 
maybe we tend to forget when we're in Geneva, you know, it's, it's, it's so internationally minded with, with all the UN institutions, but, you know, you have Médecins Sans Frontières, which is right down the street, and, and there are a lot of pressing issues uh, in and around Europe. You know, rule of law is one of them that's front and center that the European Union is talking about right now, and um, migration issues, uh, you know, the, the, there's a lot to do right there. And did you have to speak French to, to work there? Yeah, and I mean, I'm, I'm French originally, so that wasn't an issue. Um, but also, it, it, it taught me to <clears throat> how to engage with, with people who ne didn't necessarily speak my language, because obviously the migrants are coming from all across Africa or sometimes the Middle East, and some of them have very little English or very little French. And I remember having a conversation with a couple of Syrian refugees about, you know, we, we got a bit friendly, we were having coffee, and like I was just talking to them. And they were sharing their experience of what had happened in the country. And it was really, you know, like we didn't really have words to communicate. But I remember at one point, one of them, he had a missing arm. And I just asked him, like, what happened? And he was just saying, like, Al-Assad and like, just like cutting his arm off. And I was like, wow, that's <laughs> that's really intense. But also, like, it shows how much that work can be helpful. You know, you just make the connection. You're able to help in whatever way you can. and and you hope that it'll help them. Uh, and I remember one one experience that was really kind of beautiful in the sense is that I had made really good friends with one one of the migrants that was there, and he was going to try and cross over to England. And I was saying, okay, like if ever you get to the other side, like let me know. We connected on Facebook and everything. And I didn't hear from him for like three weeks, and I it sort of left my mind. And three weeks later, I got a message from him. He was like, I'm in England, and he was ecstatic, and he was just so happy, and it was like. Okay, this is, you know, this is why we do the work we do and and I hope that you can have a good life in the future. Excellent. Thank you. Then Inka, do we have uh, still uh, time for some questions, extra questions? Yes, we have some a few minutes we can ask some follow-up questions. Okay. And then move to the Q&A. So if any students have any questions for the moment, you can already start putting them in the Q&A. Okay. Um, maybe for Adeline, um, we had a question for you. Um, we noticed that you worked for DCAF uh, during your studies and uh, students want to know how did you, I mean, were you able to organize your time and um, balance working and studying? I actually had to work during my studies and so um, I was able to, at the time, like uh, Celine was saying, internships were not paid, but I was able to get uh, some uh, work that was paid. So what I did was I worked for DCAF during my study. I also worked for UNCTAD uh, part-time. Uh, <clears throat> all of these were part-time jobs. Um, it was part of what I negotiated because I did tell them that I was studying. So since... Um, the, um, I organized my hours with them based on the hours that I had to do for school. Uh, and so I, um, I was able to uh, balance work and studies at the time. I don't know how it is now, if it's a, if, since it's a one year program, probably there is more contact hours and more work to do. We had a year and a half program that was extended, so we <clears throat> probably had less hours. However, I did negotiate my time with them. Um, and so that's basically what you need to do if you want to do, uh, if you want to balance both. It's up to you to negotiate your time because in a way you are contributing to their work. You are helping them improve and contribute to what they are doing. Uh, and so you do have that power of negotiation and saying, well, this is what I can contribute. This is the reality of how much time I can give to the work. Um, so that, what, that was, that's what, what I was able to do. And also I chose the work and the internships based on those topics of interest that I had with regards to conflict, peace, and security. Um, and so, <clears throat> although I did have to earn some money to be able to live here, um, I was strategic in trying to choose uh, jobs um, that were in my field. And the great thing with Geneva is that you can find really anything that's got to do with international development or conflict, something related to the in, your, your, your topic of interest. Now, the, the important thing was to also show organizations and the institutions in, that you were working for or the wanting to internship for is that you, your passion for that topic. So that's what you need to stand out. They needed to stand out and, 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 and show them that you're interested and that you're passionate. And you're a student, so you're not supposed to know everything and have been in every, everywhere, but to show them you're willing to learn 
that you're passionate about the topic. That's what an internship is. It's not, um, it's not something that has required many years of experience, but it's just something that you also want to learn from. So that's something also uh, that complements your, um, your studies. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your answer. Zaninka, we still have time? Uh, maybe let's yes. Let's, yes, maybe one more question and then we can move to Q&A. Okay. okay. Um, mm -mm, let me look at all my questions. Um, mm -mm. Maybe Celine, um, did you find it uh, difficult to secure a job after graduation? Yeah, I mean, I think it's getting your foot in the door that's difficult. Um, I've had a very different experience than some of my friends with whom we graduated in at the same time in the same batch. I think if you have a very specific idea of a specific position or a specific organization you want to be in can be quite challenging uh, because of competition, because of a, a range of factors. My personal experience was once I had secured the internship, um, and, and I would recommend doing longer rather than short periods of internship after studies if you're going to do it full time. Uh, because as Adeline says, you're not expected to come with a set of specific skills or know the answer. What you expected to have is motivation, the intention to learn and grow into a, a job. Um, and once you have it for long enough, you become part of an organization. You, you, you make contact within the organization, but also with all the stakeholders that rotate around. And I think that's really what's key to kind of get your first job after an internship or even move from a first job to the next is creating, you know, entering this kind of community uh, where you have people with different um, because as a matter of fact, after my first job, I didn't apply as such for a job opening. It's just that you're in a position and you're here, you want to hire someone in that field or someone comes and say, listen, uh, we want to develop that program. Can you come and be part of it? So, yeah, I, I think it's really the, the first one that makes it that's really challenging. Uh, but if you're not too uh, picky or too specific in uh, what you're looking for, I suppose that helps. Thank you so much, Celine. That was really useful. Maybe I leave you for the Q and A sessions now. Yes, I see that we have questions. Kathleen, you want to take them? Yeah, uh, here. Uh, so so far, we are forty-two online. Uh, so thank you for being here. So I have a question from Jose. Have you ever considered? So I don't know who wants to answer, or if maybe the four of you wants to answer. Uh, have you ever considered founding your own organization? And how do you think your time at the Institute, the network you built there may help you to do that? Who feels Anika first one? Okay. I did actually think about this. So I okay. think, I think I can speak to this. Um, when I arrived in Geneva, I had come from the sort of community organizing and communications background, and I saw a lot of the sort of international organization world of Geneva to be really particular in their sort of methods of communication out to the rest of the world, as well as the way that they were sort of hosting events, which I found really peculiar that they would, um, for example, they would, there would be, they'd write a report and then they'd want to host a report launch event and then they would invest like a couple thousand francs into this event and like 12 people would come and then it would be very unclear sort of what the outcome was. And so I actually had thought about before I got my job with Geneva Peace Building Platform, I'd actually thought about forming some type of consultancy around strategic communications for international and peace building organizations. Um, because I think there's there, it, it, it's an evolving sort of time and there's a lot of, um, a lot of new technologies and a lot of new ways of connecting and disseminating information that can be really constructive for the world. Anyways, to get to answer your actual question, how did I think about my time at the Institute or the network I built here may help me do that. Um, I was both thinking about seeing if there were other students who wanted to sort of team up with me on that, but then also sort of just leveraging the name of the Graduate Institute and 
uh, I didn't actually get to this step, but I was sort of already amassing a little bit of a mental list of where would I start again? Who would I, you know, ask to go get a coffee with or now have a zoom coffee with, I guess, with the pandemic um, and just having honest conversations with with the people that I met. I think for me, everything that I've experienced just comes down to building honest um, and open relationships with people. Um, again, like I don't like to think of networking as a like dirty concept. It's it's really just sort of aligning interests with other people. Um, and so I think, yeah, the the sort of position of the Institute and the name of the Institute is really well regarded in Geneva. And that can be sort of an, an, an entry point into conversations with people if you are interested in founding your own organization. Yeah, Adeline, the same question. Thank yeah. you. It's a really good question. And just to add on to, to what Annika said, uh, um, I had uh, in between my uh, in my in between my first and second year of my bachelor's degree already, I went to Uganda to volunteer and I met a in one of the villages in eastern Uganda, I met a young um, community leader, um, youth community leader. He uh, with him, we a small, uh, actually, we founded a little a little NGO in eastern Uganda. Um, and so I hadn't gone, I hadn't been to the Institute yet after the Institute. Now I've set up myself as a consultant. So in a way it's my own organization, but my advice would be that, um, and there's a lot of competition for these kind of organizations already in Geneva. There's a lot of skills. There's a, um, and I think that what I think what would be most useful is what you've gained at the Institute to take that. And if you do want to found an organization or something is to go back to your country or another country where uh, there is a dearth of such organizations or uh, institutions that uh, you could use what you've gained here um, to do that over there. And I think would be much more uh, useful uh, for the communities there and yourself than to be here. I think there's a lot of competition here. Most of the work that I do as a consultant is not in Geneva. It's, it's outside. It's only a base that I have here now. But um, so, so <clears throat> I don't want to sound negative, but that's that's basically what what I think would be more useful is to take what you've gained here, the network that you've gained here, um, and also fundraising here, but to use that over there. Kilian and uh, Celine, not yet. For, for creating your own organization? Maybe, maybe I can say, uh, I think I, I haven't really given much thought to, to founding my own organization, but I know that one of the reasons why I came to the United States is I wanted to experience what the NGO world is here. Uh, in France, like there's a very limited set of NGOs. It's usually social and medical NGOs, whereas in the United States, there's an NGO for anything that you can think, think of in the sort of spectrum of international politics. Um, and that was really fascinating to me because it's such a part of, of civil life in this country and it sort of works as a, as a third actor. Um, and I think I wanted to see what it was like here and potentially come back to France and do the same thing. And I think that my time at the Institute we're sort of foundational in that and saying like, okay, these are the aspects I wanna work on. This is what everybody else is doing. Like, how can I use that? And and it's sort of what, what Aline was saying, like, what's the differentiator, right? Like, what what is, what is the need and what is the need in my country? And I think that's, that's what I wanted to go towards. And so who knows, maybe in a couple of years, that's what I'll, I'll turn to. Thank you. Um, I have a question here from Marine Krieger. Uh, I think uh, Adeline already answered to it, but still, if someone else wants to say something on that, any tips on getting that first position in the field? If someone wants to say something about that, please send your question to Q&A and not to chat because then it's, it's hard to see who asked for what. Celine, would you like to say something on that? Well, my, my, my own experience was that it's sometimes difficult to find a job in the field from not the field. <laughs> and I found it easier, for example, to, um, and maybe it's a bit in between these and the previous question, um, to understand better how I can contribute, what is actually needed and how I can help if I'm already there and I can see it for myself, rather than to apply to a first 
job from remotely. Um, that has been my experience throughout that uh, looking for a job in New York without being in New York was not practical or trying to do something meaningful in the slums of Bombay from uh, Japan was not useful. I had to go and be there and meet people and discuss with community leaders. What is it that's helpful? How can we contribute? And what could be my added value to the project? Because often there would know better than I would what is really going to help them. Um, so it goes a bit back to what I was saying before, the idea of like traveling, being exposed, also kind of help you to understand how, uh, how you put your foot in the door. How do you get to meet the people that are actually those who will make the decision, who will, who will advise you on how to go about it? Because from one context to the next is very different. So that would be uh, my personal uh, advice. And so this is the question for students and perspective, but also in, in case of transition from one field to the other one. For example, someone who is now in diplomacy and who comes back to the institute to study and who wants maybe to go into development and peace building, which kind of advice would you give? This was a question from Manali. Adeline, yeah, go ahead. Yes, so it's a very good question. A lot of, actually, there's a lot of uh, students who do come to, to us who've studied something else before they come to the institute and who want to change uh, their topic uh, or their field, uh, professional field. So I think that what you need to do is to use uh, some of the value added um, in what you've done before. So to take out the skills that you gained from the profession that you had before or the studies that you did before, the ones that are relevant to what you want to do, the new thing that you want to do, use that and then basically show that with those skills of those that skill set you can contribute to peace building security because it's something you bring from another field so that's something you, you learn with, regard, with regards to selling yourself in a way and americans sorry to say but do that really well much better than europeans or the french and so it's really a way that you need to um you need to show that those skills that you gained in that other field can also be relevant and can be actually some value added to that new field um, and then, uh, and uh, to add on to add on what Celine said, go there, um, go to the field, and go to those countries, and go to those organizations, um, and show that even though you come from a different sector, that you have uh, those things that can contribute. That you have those, that skill set that can contribute uh, to that. Um, and then what I did also, um, there was, for example, topics in the peace building that I didn't study or that I hadn't, didn't have experience in. And so what I did was I took some online courses from like Coursera or I added on after my studies uh, on some, for example, specific topics of conflict analysis, uh, free online courses that you can get from UNITAR. For, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of platforms um, to put on my CV and to add on the, those, the little bit of the theoretical uh, uh, top issues that I hadn't covered in my studies or in my past experience. Um, and that also helps in kind of breaking, uh, breaking into that different, um, different area. Thank you. Someone else on this, on this point? Okay, so if it's not the case, I have another question regarding again COVID. So we had this point already before, but still, I think there is a uh, uh, some fear, which is normal. So studying remotely is this very specific in this very specific COVID circumstances. Uh, I feel like there are less opportunities to network and find internship opportunities. Do you have any suggestion from uh, regarding this? So this question comes from uh, Mrs. Lee. Anika. Yeah, I, I think um... It is really difficult. First of all, I feel for you. It's it's hard um, and and frustrating. So I just want to like start with that. Um, I think in terms of remote work, I know that a lot of the student initiatives have moved meetings online, um, and so that's just I know it's it's maybe not exactly the same, but that would be sort of a first step is to join and get involved with one or two student initiatives and, and attend those meetings online. And if you see nothing that you are interested in. You can start your own. Um, I understand that it's actually fairly simple to to start um, initiatives. So, 
So that would be one step. Um, and then also one thing that I've seen in Geneva is that a lot of things are moving online, just sort of interagency. So at the, the peace building platform, what we do is just connect all the peace building actors in Geneva. And we, for example, what I'm doing is managing the environmental peace building cluster. So we now have an entirely online community of practice of 100 um, environmental peace building practitioners and any of I've I've had two capstone groups, for example, that have reached out and I've now just included them in the community of practice. And so they're, uh, you know, MAA students, or sorry, uh, the Mint students at the Graduate Institute who are now regularly interacting with 100 different peace building professionals. So I, I've seen like UNEP is having constant webinars. Um, UNDP is having webinars. I would just sort of try to dig in and the one other piece of advice I once got was whether you're attending attending an online event or uh, in person is to always ask a question, even if you don't have a perfectly phrased question, even if you stutter while you speak, asking the question then also gives you an excuse to follow up with the person afterwards. So those are just a couple of examples of ways that you might make it work while also recognizing that you're right, it's hard. It's true. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, answer, Anika. I have here a, a question of uh, Hasna Ja, uh, and also it's a question of reinsurance. Uh, and I think this kind of platform is really what we need to have everyone from everywhere all the time online and speak and network. And so the question is, uh, however, I agree with you that the networking is very important to get a professional experience, but being a non-EU citizen does not give you the chance to have more opportunities and you are only offered internships. So who feel uh, that uh, Kilian, thank you. And, and, and Adeline after, thank you. Yeah. Um... I think I can I can touch upon that from my own experience uh, being a, a European citizen in the United States. I, I do have a little bit more of an advantage being a European citizen, but I came here for an internship and I was on a J1 visa. And so the visa was for one year and I was lucky enough to have my internship extended for a year. It was three months originally. Um, and then I was really lucky that the organization wanted to keep me, but it was a very complicated process because with a J-1 visa, you have to leave for a year because it's it's supposed to be like a cultural exchange that you're supposed to apply somewhere else. I was lucky enough to be able to go and work in our Mexico office. And then they hired me back in the U.S. through the H-1B process, which took six months of you know paperwork, et cetera. And, and I really relate to what the person is saying. Uh, I think it's about, you know, you get internships, right? And something that Anika said earlier is really fundamental is like hone your skills and like do the best you can to make yourself indispensable. And then it's it's really sort of a hopeful kind of chance thing, but hopefully that means that you can have someone petition for you or you can sort of make a better case for yourself of, okay, I need to stay for X, Y, Z reason and I can, I, I, I can get that foot in the door, but it is it is a significant extra barrier for for people, whether it's in the European Union or the United States, um, and it's not an easy one to overcome. But that's the best advice I can give is is you know make yourself indispensable, hone your skills, and just seize the moment when it appears. Adeline, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> I know it's a it's an amazing privilege to be able to have a passport uh, and to be studying in Geneva with a European passport. I know that it gives a lot of priority and advantages. Um, and so I also do have South African passport, which is also pretty useless. So, um, but I understand that there are difficulties. And um, the point here is that um, you once, uh, as Killian said, once you once you do get that internship, and the, the point is that you can get an internship, you can use the advantage of being from outside of Europe, um, that value added of being from a different country with different languages that, that has a value added for that for that organization. Once you're in the door, even through internships, um, then you have a very much higher chance of being able to be recruited and they can support your, they do support, I mean, it's limited now, but they, they used to support um, uh, non-EU citizens in terms of 
these are things. But then uh, other parts of Europe, they're much more supportive than Switzerland. So even though you do do your studies in Switzerland, do internships in Switzerland, and then maybe use that use those organizations based here to get opportunities with the organization, but in other offices in, in Europe, um, that can also be a possibility. Um, but use the value added of being from a different country with a different language in terms of being able to get something here. Um, Could I just really quickly add, um, yeah. I definitely do not have the answers on this. Um, I, uh, yeah, uh, but I, I did actually collaborate with Anine and another um, graduating graduate institute student on a series of podcast interviews for Geneva Peace Week around careers and peace building. And then I'll put this in the Q and A box, but we did a couple of interviews with people specifically around um, what it means to be a non EU citizen coming and working in international Geneva, as well as recruitment uh, criteria for the UN. So I'll put the I'll put the link to that in the box, which could just be another resource on this question. Thank you. Maybe one last question from Maria to all the panelists uh, regarding getting a PhD for someone who wants to be a practitioner, uh, pra practitioner, sorry, in the in the field, who feel at ease with that, who has a PhD here on board. <laughs> so someone. Yeah, Adeline, thank you. So I don't have a PhD, but <clears throat> after I finished my master's, uh, my master's thesis, um, my master's dissertation, um, I was uh, the professors that co-directed it uh, suggested that it was a good topic for a PhD. Um, <clears throat> at the time, in 2007, I was much more interested to go back to the field. I had been a lot in the field, as I said, during the summers, during the breaks, even during my undergraduate. Um, and so the idea for me was to actually, I was much more interested to go back to the field and do practical work. Uh, and so it, it wasn't attractive to me at the time. And during my, and you know, for the last 15 years, I've seen in the field, uh, in, in the topic of peace, conflict and security, uh, people who do have PhDs and people who don't. Um, and I think that it's really, um, if you do a PhD with the prospect of a, of a, of a you know, for professional prospect, I don't think that the real good enough reason to do a PhD. It's a PhD is something that you want to do because you want to delve really deep into a topic and you want to become a real expert and you, you want to research that for four years and you know want to sweat and bleed on it because that's what it is. Um, and it's not something that'll get you a better job or it's, it's, it's not, I don't feel in our field, it's something that gives you an advantage or not in the field. It's something, it's, an, it's a personal choice and it's a, it's a personal journey of your own. Um, so, um, so yes, and I, but I do think that there are nowadays a lot of PhDs that are kind of like um, uh, more uh, policy based and uh, more evidence based than theoretical based PhDs. And I think those in our field are really interesting to contribute to the work uh, of organizations that actually go and do peace building in the field. So if it's evidence based, if there's research that comes out from your PhD that's evidence based that helps organizations and institutions in doing better peace building, then super. I mean, it's, it's, it's great. Um, but then again, you need to have the funding to be able to do another more four years of doing PhD. A lot of institutions uh, are, are funding PhDs, especially in the topic of conflict mediation, uh, security issues, security studies within Europe. A lot of institutions are funding PhDs. Um, so it really depends on <clears throat> how you want to, you know, build that research and the reason why you want to do it. Thank you, Adeline. Uh, I just want to um, say one word be before I give the floor back to Zani, who organized this roundtable. And I think it was really nice to see a uh, different uh, time, different moment of the of the career uh, in peace building with, with you. So thank you for being here. Uh, I just remind you online that there is about 20,000 alumni in the world, and this is part of the network you you get when you come to the Graduate Institute. So there is about uh, 40 chapters, 20 ambassadors, which makes 60 representations. And uh, Victoria, who's working with Zani and me, uh, is, is, is in charge of these chapters and ambassadors. So please feel free to, to get in touch with us and to ask us our your questions if you want to, to be in touch with someone somewhere uh, regarding a, a position or a field of, of work. Thank you for being here and I give you the floor back, Zani. Thank you. Thank you. And then I think I'll ask Céline and Kilian if they want to conclude quickly. I think I saw their hands up with the question. If you want to say something, you can, no? Um, okay. 
then I'll just say thank you so much for everyone that came. Thank you for thank you to the panelists so much for all the advice. I think everyone that listened, you just have to take the advice and use it the way it applies to your life because there is recruitment that's changing, less jobs, more jobs, or like improving digital skills. There's going to the field, but also thinking about the field as far, but also close. So I think um, take, not with a grain of salt, but take it and apply it to your life the way that makes sense. And then um, join the next round tables if they also interest you, which we'll share about really soon. Uh, yes, I think that's it. Thank you so much for everyone that came and I wish you all a great day.